Hi everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady and today I want to talk about container gardening in late July. Specifically dealing with, well, plants that just die because it's really incredibly hot out. And I have quite a few to be able to show you. And this really goes right along with the idea of reevaluating your pots mid-summer, changing them up, getting them refreshed so that you'll be able to enjoy them for the duration of time that we have that's frost free. Here in Zone 7, Central North Carolina, that's typically um, leading up to Thanksgiving. So we still have several months that I can actually enjoy my summer containers. But as you can see, it is definitely time for me to make some edits. So let me turn the camera around and show you some of the casualties that I have growing in pots uh, here as we close out the month of July. Tomatoes. <laughs> what else can I say? Some tomatoes are really, really great and others aren't. And what's super weird is that this one that is dead is exactly the same as this one. And look, they're a few feet apart. They get exactly the same care and they're the same variety and they're in the same soil. And none of the other plants are damaged at all. I mean, obviously I need to do some trimming on the bottom leaves here. This one is totally happy. This one is totally not. I don't have an explanation other than just tomatoes and roll your eyes. The easiest solution for this pot is I'm just gonna cut the tomato down, remove the cage. And I'm actually just gonna replace that with a glass flower to make this pot look extra beautiful. I'm not going to mess around and add anything to it because I can still keep this pot really watered even though I know that it's pretty root bound because of course I've got a hose right here. These two pots are really the two easiest to keep watered because they are so accessible and actually everything here at the driveway bed is the first thing that gets watered every day. All right, while I'm talking about casualties, you'll see another one here. And this is the Whirlwind Blue Savola that I've been so impressed with. And here it's dead completely. Obviously nothing else is, everything else looks fine. But literally a few feet away is the same plant doing absolutely great with exactly the same conditions. So it's really hard sometimes to find a rational explanation. And I'm not even gonna try because honestly here I've got two examples in the same area with the same care and the same soil and that tomato is dead that tomato isn't this savola is looking great same savola looking bad now i'm planning to do a video just about rice because that is really one of my most popular topics but i did want to show you right here the difference between seeding in late april versus seeding in early june see how much taller the plant is overall it just looks better this one which i did as a demonstration at the ralston arboretum for ralston blooms is already starting to uh flower and ultimately set seed you see how short the plant is it's the same variety this is the difference in seeding too early now obviously you're gonna be able to let it flower and get seed regardless of what time you sow it, but you're gonna have healthier plants and what I think will be a much more significant harvest on the plants that were seeded later. Now, if you come across here, these were the very last rice that I sowed. And this was like the middle of the end of June. This is black mudras. And see a big difference. These are just really just starting to get their active vegetation growth. And these won't be flowering until realistically after Labor Day, which is really the goal is I don't really want to have miniature rice plants growing and seeding this early in the season. Now these are in pots with no drainage holes and I haven't watered yet today. Usually I have this as standing water. And you can see this pot, which had a slightly more difficult time getting established because we were getting such heavy rains earlier in the season. 
um, isn't nearly as large, but it's coming along and I think it's gonna really fill out and look beautiful. Now, looking at the casualty of this pot, this is time. And it's really funny, I was just doing Google searches. Why did my time die? What insects bother time? And literally, there are no resources that will tell you what is causing this, which is stupid because obviously it's real. This happens every single year. This is really why thyme is not a reliable perennial herb in the Southeast. And what you could see is the insect that's getting on this is also getting onto this pesto party basil, which is really not okay. It basically defoliates the thyme altogether. So I'm gonna do a few things here in this pot. Obviously I'm gonna cut back the thyme. I'm gonna actually remove this basil, clean it up, get it to a place where hopefully this insect won't cause trouble. And um, I think I'm actually gonna go ahead and just undo this pot of herbs and get the oregano and rosemary planted in the ground somewhere or into a different pot. All right, probably the saddest casualties of the season. Well, in my opinion, are these Rex begonias. And yeah, this is pretty not unusual. Um, it started happening about two weeks ago, right before I left for my trip to Ohio and Michigan. And you can see they're dead. Um, there you go. I've been waiting to do this for this video. It's not uncommon at all. This, this is just sort of what happens in the Southeast to these really pretty fancy leaf begonias. So disappointed, but I trialed them. They're getting marked on the dead sheet for the information for the genetics companies. And what's interesting is I do still have two in this pot and though they are looking a bit worse for where they aren't totally dead. They had some wilt, but have kind of recovered. You can see this one doesn't look great, but it's not dead. So good to know, good to know. So I think uh, with these trial plants, like. Well, it's actually really important information for them to know when a plant dies and how long it lived. And I think that it was the realistic summer conditions that did these begonias in. We've had an incredibly mild early summer, but now we are what we usually are, which is basically unbearable. Um, it's hot, it's humid. Uh, we haven't been getting much rain. And that's exactly the condition that these Rex begonias suffer in. It's why they do really well in the Pacific Northwest, but not so much in the Southeast. So obviously this pot has a big dead spot in it. I'm gonna go ahead and fill that in with some coleus that I rooted inside just in vases. Um, they were just pieces from the wall that were kind of growing too tall. And, you know, I like to root coleus for the very purpose of filling in pots and filling in open spaces throughout the garden at this time of year, because it's inevitable that by late July, early August, we have some plants that are just underperforming and need to just get ripped out and get replaced. And coleus absolutely never let me down. I've gotta say my all time favorite summer plant is coleus. Well, they aren't the prettiest coleus cuttings that you'll ever see, but they are well rooted. And I'm basically going to take this clump that has about six different stems and I'm going to get it planted here in the back of this pot in hopes that it will just fill in the gaps. And actually, the more I look at it, I think I'm going to add two clumps just to really make it count. I fill in this whole back section. That way this pot won't be lopsided and look silly. So just gonna, gonna dig out the roots of the dead begonias. There were two that died in this pot. And again, there's really no rhyme or reason. They're just a few feet apart. They essentially get exactly the same care, the same soil. They were planted the same day. And 
one pot still has living begonias and the other doesn't. It's, I guess, the perfect example of how you are not in the driver's seat when you are a gardener. Now, it's going to take a few days for these to really perk up and start to actively grow and develop roots that are better suited for soil and not water. So I'm just going to make sure that I keep these well watered. As I was cleaning up that herb pot, it occurred to me, obviously, those are spider mites. I don't think it's worth trying to save the time, but I am going to go ahead and take this opportunity to spray the basil just to make sure that I don't have any residual mites on the plant. And I'm just using insecticidal soap. And this is of course soap that I bought. It's organic safe. Um, it basically just kills bugs on contact. Um, it controls aphids, mealybugs, mites, leafhoppers, scale, thrips, whiteflies, and other listed pests. I'm not sure if, um, spider mites. Yeah, spider mites fall into that category under mites. So I'm going to give that a good spray. And then while I was here, I was doing a little pruning on the wall coleus. And I saw the telltale sign of mealybugs, which are ants. So whenever you see lots of ants going to a place, they actually kind of work in tandem with the mealybugs. And so now is the perfect opportunity to go ahead and spray the mealybugs, which are basically in um, kind of where the leaf and the stem touch. Uh, and let me get the camera so I can show you up close what they look like. Okay, so first of all, it's kind of hard to see, but you see there's an ant climbing around and then you follow it back and you see the white on the stem and those are mealybugs. And you know, they do squish really easily but it's definitely just easier to go ahead and coat the plants with insecticidal soap. And really in theory, that should take care of the problem. One application, you can see I've got mealybugs throughout the wall, kind of on all the different varieties. They're not really variety specific. They're not terrible at this stage, which is why it's really great to catch them now. Um, and aha, uh -huh, here you can see some down there congregating in that spot. So I'm going to go ahead and just give a really thorough spray to the entire wall and um, keep my eyes peeled if I have to do an additional spray in a week or so. I think that'll pretty well ward them off for the rest of the season. And of course, one of the most important aspects of insect control or mammal deterring is convenience. And so you'll note, I'm gonna stash that insecticidal soap right here on my front porch. So when I walk out and look at the wall, I don't have to go all the way back to the shed to grab it. I'm just making it convenient so that I'll actually apply it. Because remember, these remedies only work if you actually employ them. Having them on your property shoved in a shed is step one, but if you're not actually applying it, it's not going to do anything. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people about deterring deer or rabbits and saying, well, this repellent really does work. And they're like, eh, and it's because they're not applying it regularly. And you have to apply it regularly because irrigation washes it off, dew washes it off, uh, rain washes it off. So it's something that you need to just put on your radar and make it convenient. And I just want to also acknowledge how grateful I am for all of these organic, really safe to use insect methods, insect control methods, because in my experience in the nursery industry, I held a, a pesticide applicator's license for 15 years. And um, things I used to have to apply just as a preventative to make it so that we could ship plants across the United States, 
not even necessarily treating an insect that was causing a problem. It was just to apply in, in case there could potentially be an issue that arose. And I'm so grateful that I don't have to do that now as a home gardener. And I hope other home gardeners will recognize, um, well, what a privilege it is to have access to a product like insecticidal soap that basically takes care of all of your common insect problems. It's totally safe for you to spray. It's not gonna kill any beneficial pollinators. It's very specific for the insect that's causing trouble. Well, I also hope you'll agree that now is a really good time to evaluate some of your containers, make some necessary changes so that you know your pots will look good for the whole duration of the season. And even if you're not repotting them completely, sometimes just moving them into different places, making sure you're turning the pots so that they're getting light on all sides, um, can really just reinvent the space and you know, also just make it so that it looks new and exciting for you to enjoy. So I'm gonna end this video here. I of course have a ton of other containers to evaluate, but it's really hot out and I wanna lead by example. I don't want anybody to ever feel tortured by their garden. So I'm gonna consider this to be an accomplishment. I'm gonna go inside and enjoy the air conditioning. Well, as always, thanks so much for watching everybody. Happy container gardening.